there goes the agenda for the day. Let's have on stage our next panelist, Women on Influence. Each of the panelists represent a distinctive pillar of work and have created a strong sphere of influence. Our colleague Priyanka Avasti would be leading the moderation with the Women of Influence. Priyanka Avasti is the, also the co-founder of Bizdivas and Altavis. An ex-banker, she is passionate about women's economic empowerment. She designs and facilitates the diversity and inclusion interventions of Altavis Consulting. She leads the Bizdivas initiatives for the Mumbai and the Western region. Please put your hands together for Priyanka Avasti. Thank you. Today we are here to meet four amazing women. As thought leaders, they can influence behavior, they can create acceptance for new ideas, and they can help discard deep-rooted stereotypes. So let's find out how do they overcome barriers and how do they accomplish so much. It gives me great pleasure to invite the well-known Monica Hallam, editor Mint Money, Yale Fellow, and board member FPSB India. Monica works with the regulators for fair policy and equitable participation in retail finance. She regularly appears on business channels to give financial advice. Welcome, Monica. Thank you. We have the vibrant Ratna Veera. Ratna has led communications in HR for large organizations. She is the author of the best selling Daughter by Court Order. As Sherry Blair said, it's an important book. And the good news is, Ratna is already writing her next novel. From Singapore comes the lovely Vinika Rao, Executive Director in SEAD Emerging Markets Institute. She's headed various businesses across Asia before her foray into education. She's done a TEDx, spoken at the World Investment Forum Geneva, and is often quoted in international media. And here is a familiar face the dynamic Wing Commander Pooja Thakur, leader of the Inter-Services Guard of Honor for President Obama. <laughs> Pooja handles multiple domains, including promoting careers in the Air Force. She loves adventure sports and is a mom to a nine-year-old. Big round of applause. You're all women of influence, and I'd like to ask Monica, what has been the main factor that helped you succeed? I actually would have to ask uh, Can't hear? Can we have the volume, please? Yeah, okay, so I think I'll just use this. Great. Okay, sure. Um, I think early influences are a huge uh, nudge to where you really end up. So growing up, in a household, a middle class, first generation migrant household into Delhi. My father is, was at that time a professor of economics. It, it's a household which was, uh, you know, two, two daughters, 45 years ago, should have ended differently. But my elder sister is also in finance, she's a banker. And I turned out, uh, you know, it's almost like the Divar story, chasing bankers when they do wrong things. So <laughs> she's the banker and I'm the girl person who's chasing people who do bad things. Um, I think um, early influences are, um, make a lot of difference in terms of uh, where you finally end up. And that's one. Second is choices that you make. And third is who you marry. Because that is, again, something which can either really make you fly or pull you down. So it's really about relationships, with the early relationships, relationships with your profession, and your own family, because that can be either a black hole, which pulls you down, or just allows you to fly. Lovely. Thank you, Monica. Vinika, would you like to add something? Sure. And actually, before I answer that question, I want to warn your audience. You know, we were talking over lunch about how uh, the previous panel, while uh, very interesting, was rather politically correct. So we've decided to shake things up a little bit. So do feel free to ask exciting and controversial questions. I hope I have your permission for that. You do. <laughs> okay, so in terms of factors that have been influential, uh, I mean, we have uh, 
very inspirational lady sitting uh, on the dais with us and you know that brings to mind uh, my own uh, childhood as uh, again an army brat and I think someone else mentioned that they were an army brat too. Um, and when I look back and think of uh, some things that made my life easier as, um, as I faced political and um, sometimes uh, professional challenges, the fact that as an army brat you used to move cities, you learn to speak different languages. I remember doing Marathi when my dad was posted to Mumbai and then suddenly going to Amritsar and having to take an exam in Punjabi, which incidentally is the only exam I've ever failed because <laughs> I didn't know the script. Um, from, you know, moving from uh, fairly elitist uh, all-girls convent school to suddenly going to a border town and uh, joining a, a Kendra with the Alay, with you know, people that you didn't immediately sort of uh, empathize with and then you realize they're all just like us and there's and now I actually feel that it would be more difficult to make the reverse transition. So um, I think the lessons that, um, that our HR friends would talk about in terms of learning agility and adaptability, uh, diversity and inclusion, just being very comfortable making new friends or the whole thing about networking and being able to have meaningful conversations with new people uh, in a short uh, space of time, all of that is something that's comes uh, much easier to me now because I did it as a matter of course as a child. So uh, I certainly have a big thank you to the armed forces for giving me that sort of a background. So Ratna, can you describe a key challenge you faced in your journey? Well, let me see pause because um, there have been so many. Okay. Um, I um, kind of agree with Monica that uh, so, you know, she's put it very well about uh, the early influences and uh, so did Monica, uh, so did uh, Vinica. However, uh, sometimes some of us make it not because of our families but because despite our families and the challenges that we face. So uh, I think that's been, um, that's been a motivator for me. Uh, sometimes the bars are very high and sometimes uh, you see through it. So I think it's that. Uh, being an Indian working woman, professionally qualified in corporate India, has its own dimensions, uh, which maybe many of you are aware of. Um, and you work really hard to get to wherever you do. Um, and then take, believing in yourself and taking a leap of faith uh, and writing a book. And watching it climb the charts has been uh, exhilarating, uh, terrifying, uh, as well as wonderful. Great, lovely. Pooja, would you like to add something? Oh, well, is mine working? Am I audible? Can you hear okay. Pooja? So I think this is better. So um, I would probably agree to everybody, you know. And, uh, you know, I would agree to her first because I'm an AMI grad too. Oh. Uh, so besides learning how to be very adaptable, uh, I guess very early in age, you know, I learned how to fake it, you know. Because, uh, Generally, you know, because you're not, when you're a kid, you're not really born with, you know, doing everything all the time. But because you're shifting places all the time, and you have to make new friends, and, you know, it's like the same thing that you're going to different places, you're going to different companies. And uh, my parents know, and nobody else knows, that every two years when I have to go to a new school, every week at home before going to school, I have to cry like anything, okay? And it's not very easy, you know, to every time make new friends, to go to a new place where you don't know anybody. But I guess those few years made me learn how to fake my confidence, made me fake it so much that I became more confident today, you know. So uh, that's one part. And like uh, you put it across that, yes, your family is going to make a difference, your uh, surroundings are going to make a difference. But what you are and what you become is what is actually going to stand out throughout the years. They're going to be there to support you, but if you're not ready to take on the challenge, nobody would be there. Nobody can be there to support you. The difference because, uh, yes, there was a time in life when probably I wouldn't be sitting here in uniform, you know, when I joined the academy. So it's, um, it's like a dungeon, okay? You're going in at the academy, it's like, it's like those actually horror movies where you see those huge gates. Of course, they're not like that, but that's how you feel. You really feel them like that. And uh, you get in the first day and, you know, you being an army brat, you degree, you're really pampered, okay? Nobody's spoken badly to you. You've not done any work. And the first day you get in, you like shouted at, you know? You like 
a lot of rakda, okay? You're rolling all the way along, you know, on your backs, side rollings, front rollings, back rollings, head up, stand up. You get cycles after a month, but you're not riding them, the cycles are riding you, you know? And things like that, and the very first day, you need to run 10 kilometers. Okay, fine, I'm a healthy kid, but I'm not a runner. Okay, I'm not an athlete. And you're begging, you huffing, puffing, and telling those guys that, please help me, I'm gonna fall here. And all he can do is shout at you, bloody get up. Okay, <laughs> and generally my parents had come to leave me and the sec I'm just crying, I'm not able to tell my parents that I don't want to give up. So it's those moments in life when, you know, your parent is looking at you and he actually told me that you can, you know, I'll take you back. I don't know where I've put you in, you know. But I just told him that, okay, fine, after I was like half going to give up, you know, half Great. give up and say that, yeah, take me back. But I just told him, okay, give me two days, you know. So that ability to try and test our own limits is what actually takes us forward, I guess. Lovely, Pooja, and we are glad you you stayed put. Yeah, great. Um, it's felt that uh, men are more suitable for senior leadership roles. In your experience, is this true? Uh, I, I'll, I'll take that first because uh, my work is in finance, and when, <laughs> when I look around me in the corporate world, I only see very successful women. So whether it's banking, or whether it's uh, the National Stock Exchange today is run by a woman, Chitra. Um, and in fact, I did uh, message a few people before this session today. I messaged mm -hmm. Chitra, I messaged Nachiket Moru, who was in ICICI Bank. And uh, so I'm obsessively asking this question that, you know, what is it about finance and women which, uh, which has, you know, really in the world, I think we have the largest number of women in high finance. And on completely the other side of the spectrum, you have the non-finance woman, even if she is a professional and not a housewife, um, who almost take pride in saying, oh, I don't understand numbers, okay? Oh, I don't understand finance. The men take care of it. So there is this vast majority who sort of take pride in saying, I don't do numbers, but you have all these women who have filtered through. And the one thing which <clears throat> came through was that um, when the Indian banking financial sector was sort of uh, flowering, that is the time that ICICI, um, as the incubator of women leaders, was coming into its own because of a person called Mr. Vagu, who's now, of course, retired. So, you know, an individual, and also then it kind of reflects back to organizations like Biz Divas. This little bit of a leg, leg up, this little bit of a nurturing environment incubated a whole culture of women in finance, women leaders in finance. So you have 45% of ICICI, which is women. You have 45% of the National Stock Exchange, which is women. So it really matters what sort of an organization you're in. And Women in finance have proved that uh, it really does not, the gender does not matter. All right, but still, I mean, I would persist. Why don't we see more women CEOs if we don't look at the financial sector? Um, so actually, um, I'm one of the women who do do numbers, so I'm a former banker. But having said that, I'm sure nobody in this room, and definitely not the men, is uh, going to say that women don't make good uh, leaders. Um, I think women actually, in some cases, make better leaders. And uh, it's because of all of the attributes that some people refer to in the morning, whether it's empathy or uh, you know, collaboration or just uh, almost like uh, you know, the feminine instinct where you can sort of understand what the other person is trying to tell you. So, um, but I would agree, Priyanka, that uh, there aren't that many women in uh, top corporate positions or even in uh, political uh, positions of power. I mean, even in the US, they're getting very excited about the fact that maybe once again a woman has a shot of being the president. So, clearly something hasn't quite worked. Um, and uh, I do want to make a point about saying that, you know, just because uh, you've maybe made a choice to not continue in a career or you've decided that you've uh, worked for several years and you want to now maybe use your time to be at home and uh, bring up a family, you're not any less a woman of influence than any of us on, uh, on this um, stage right now. I mean, you could be influencing two or three very smart children to become future leaders. So that's also an important uh, aspect to, to keep in mind. So whatever the, the decisions a woman's made in terms of you know, how she wants to have influence uh, in the world, it's important that the decision should have been hers. 
And if that's a, something that an organization allows, then you've already achieved quite a bit. Can I add to that? I agree with uh, both of you. But I want to say, uh, especially because you brought up families, and, it, and let's talk about the Indian perspective, which is that uh, at a certain point in your career, sometimes some women take time off. Uh, the amount of time that you take off varies. Um, however, getting back and getting back on the saddle is a decision that uh, that is yours. So you should, you know, the woman has to feel in control as a leader, as a corporate person, as a writer, whoever. Um, and you expand your world rather than contract it. So expand your aspirations to include the children, include the family, and also accom accommodate your own ambition because you're a person in your full right. Small, um, so sure, this one. is like just a personal, very quick personal story and I agree with you. I took seven years out to uh, be with my daughter when she was really small. And uh, exactly, I, it expanded out. I mean, I used those seven years to study more, to train myself, to do all kinds of different things in the area that I had chosen, which was personal finance. And um, at eight years old, this little chit of a thing looks at me and says, all mothers go to work. Go to work? And I began kind of partly going back to work. <laughs> so that's interesting. Um, so, you know, I still feel that men are more influential in all spheres, be it political, professional, or social. Pooja, you have led thousands of men. What does it take to be a leader? Um, well, in the forces, you're taught to be a leader from the very first day, actually. Um, you know, leadership being a quality, of course, uh, besides being inerrant, uh, this is one quality which is tested amongst candidates when they get in, you know, because, uh, because see, leadership, of course, is uh, not only about being dominant or forceful, it's also about compassion and, uh, you know, a lot of things which are associated to women rather than a lot of things which get aligned with the uh, men characteristics. So. Uh, you know, with us, of course, when I talk about personally being in the forces, you, you, you're a leader right from the first day. The moment you get trained, you know, of course, you might be the junior most officer, but you will have thousands and plus men working under you. So you have to lead by example, you know, you, you are tested and thereafter you are trained for attributes and for body language and the way of dealing to be a leader. And um, it's something which we probably can manage to be assertive at the same time and at the same time show warmth. Um, but I guess when you ask a general question, you know, I think there are a lot of intrinsic and extrinsic factors why women are not CEOs. It's about our own self and it's also about the organization and the society together which make us, because uh, lately we'd gone somewhere and uh, there was a lady, another panelist, who asked the people among, you know, amongst us that how many of you see yourself as CEOs? You know, so the number of women who would probably you know, lift up their hands are much lesser than the number of men wanting to do that. It's because of certain inherent feminine qualities which we have of trying to subdue ourselves, trying not to take risk, and to think forward of other things rather than just a profession. You know. OK, interesting. Monica, at Yale, um, they groom future leaders. So what are some of the leadership qualities that women either lack or need to develop? I will have to agree with what you said. It is really a space in your own head. And I think all our individual journeys, we've come to a certain point, at least I have in my career and life, where when you look back, a lot of the obstacles which I thought were created were actually sitting in my own head. So somewhere each of us walked through a door and it is that walking through whether it's a physical problem like you had or it could just be a very serious sort of a work obstacle, a situation which you think you can't deal with or what most women face is balancing all these balls of work and home and kids and um, so it's really being able to sort of give each thing the respect that it needs because um, I, I, I have a very busy work life and I also am a very house proud person. So it's, you know, it's kind of seamless. Uh, a meeting in high finance, five minutes later in the car, I'm ordering chicken on the phone. 
And I don't see one as being higher or lower. So it's just about this whole, um, so what I understood at Yale is that authenticity to yourself is possibly the most important thing. You have to really recognize why you're doing what you're doing, what makes you do what you do, and to be okay with it. Okay, so it's okay if there's been a bad day. It's okay if that grand aunt who came, you couldn't, uh, you know, take care of us. It's okay. So just cut yourself a little slack, make some mistakes. You, we are not perfect. It's okay to lose your temper. Okay. So it's all. Can I add to that and say, uh, for me, the key word was trust yourself, believe in your dreams, and go for it. Don't let anyone stop you. You know, people will tell you, when I was writing, I mean, you know, I rose to CX positions in my corporate career, and I was working till last June, and I knew my book was coming out. And a lot of people told me, first-time writers in English, not read. Uh, first-time writers won't get published. You know, first-time writers this, first-time writers that. I looked at J.K. Rowling. She got 21 rejections before she got published, and look how and where she is. I didn't reach 21, uh, but I got published. Um, and guess what? J.K. Rowling was below me on India's top 10 one, one, you know? So you can make it happen. I sold my book as movie rights uh, much before I got a publisher. So dream big. Who's stopping you? Don't stop yourself. I mean, that's, that's not it. And that's true for men and women. But women, for sure, go for it. And that's what I tell my daughter and my son. Wonderful. Um, if I can just um, answer that. When I first started my career as a banker, I remember every big meeting I went to, I only wore black. And I have a naturally soft voice, so I would try really hard to speak loudly because I thought nobody was going to hear me. But I figured out very quickly that that was the exact opposite of what I needed to do. Now I'm very comfortable when I go for a board meeting, I never wear black. I always wear red or pink, and I'm quite happy to do that. <laughs> Having said that, a lot more of my metrosexual male colleagues now wear pink than I do. <laughs> but uh, in any case, I think it's very important to celebrate your femininity, to be absolutely comfortable, as you said, in your skin, because we have so many advantages. And if I have a soft voice now, I find it's an advantage, because almost always, if I'm not speaking loudly enough, some gentleman's going to get up and say, let's give the lady a chance. And once he gives it to me, I never give the mic back, of course. <laughs> So I wonder uh, if the younger generation is any different, and Vinika, coming back to you again. At INSEAD, you recently conducted a study on millennials. What kind of leaders with, will the younger generation make? Are they any different? So yeah, I should uh, tell you what the study was about very quickly. So basically, what we wanted to do was to test some of the common sort of, uh, you know, preconceived notions everybody has about this young generation, the 18 to 30 year olds. And I, I heard some references in the morning to this. You know, we believe, and I'm sure most of you agree with, or have at some point thought this, that young people these days uh, don't really want to work hard, but they would like to be promoted every six months. Thank you very much. Uh, they don't care about money anymore, but work-life balance is very, very important. Or uh, the parents are so hyper-involved that, you know, they'll even come along for a job interview. Right? I'm sure you've heard these things or thought about that. So that's where we started out. But as we uh, surveyed some 16,000 millennials all over the world, we found, found out some very interesting things. And to bring it in the context of your question, uh, the very interesting thing uh, we found was that the younger these people are, the narrower is the difference between men and women in terms of the kind of leadership behavior they'll exhibit or the kinds of leaders they'll make. So both men and women that we surveyed invariably said they wanted to become leaders. Um, both men and women said that uh, money was still important, but work-life balance was crucial too. However, work-life balance for them is not what we assume about it. Uh, both the men and the women said that if they wanted to walk a dog at 4 p.m. and so they wanted to be let off early from work, you have to allow it. It's not just the women, the men wanted it too. But of course, both of them were then going to stay up at 3 a.m. and you know, in their PJs, have their laptop and finish the presentation. So they were going to work hard anyway. And the responses were very, very similar. So it's not about the gender, it's a, it's a you know, generational thing. So that's is the become gap important. between uh, the attitudes of men and women narrowing now? Is that what you're saying? 
I think so. I mean, at least that's what the survey revealed uh, almost everywhere. Um, the differences were more pronounced uh, from one geography to the other. So uh, how um, you know, a 20-year-old man in India uh, reacts to leadership-related questions is very different from how a 20-year-old man in, in Brazil does. So that's where we saw big differences. But between a 20-year-old woman and a 20-year-old man in India, actually not that much of a gap. Thank you so much. Please, please do. So I think we are living in maybe two different countries. So there is this uh, population that you have accessed, and then there is this complete, um, the deeply Indian traditional family where girls wear certain kind of clothes, they don't speak. So there is just these two worlds. And um, somebody told me something very insightful that it is actually good that we are hearing all the stories of domestic violence and divorces because finally women are beginning to talk about it. It was always there. It's there, it's just talking hidden. about it. Yeah. Wow, that's really cool that you said it and articulated it. I really believe that read daughter by court order, it looks at that, it looks at mindset change. Even in the so-called educated upper echelons of society, you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised if we scratch deeper, how many of you are going to be honest about what you truly believe and what boundaries you set for yourself and your daughter. So, thank you. Um, Pooja, as a woman in the armed forces, uh, you have a very demanding job. I think your husband is in the corporate world um, and you have an influential position. How do you maintain balance? Um, would it be a typical question or a typical answer, I guess? Uh, I guess, uh, you know, when you talk about balance in your professional and your uh, family life, you know, of course you're in a profession because you are up to it, right? And you are going for it and you're looking for balance only thereafter, otherwise you would have given it up. Um, so I think it's the husband and the wife, the spouse together, which are going to really strike the balance. Um, and I think both of us have been very adventurous and risk-taking in him marrying an armed forces girl and me marrying outside to somebody in the corporate because we don't get to stay together too much and uh, uh, you know all those things it's it's worse than being in the forces matter in the forces or it's worse being in the corporate sector itself uh, but at the same time we both look at it that we get the best of both worlds uh, we get the security and the safety what the what the armed forces offers me and uh, I you know, I have the other side too, wherein I get an experience from him being with his friends and colleagues of the corporate sector also. Uh, so I guess the balance is just about ourselves knowing that it can be done. And uh, I guess it's also about not being trying to be the superwoman all the time and uh, nothing wrong in asking for help and support. And as women, yes, we have to thrive a lot on relationships, so we have to have that relationship with our parents and our in-laws to be able to ask for that kind of a support when we need it. Um, at the same time, like I remember in the earlier panel or, you know, ma'am here was talking about where sp spouses need to understand each other's profession. I think the success comes when the spouses understand each other's passion rather than profession. That is more important, you know, because your profession, you'll be just doing your work. But once you understand each other's passion, maybe not just routine work, that's when you can really thrive. Thank you, Pooja. Ratna, you had a very interesting journey, uh, you know, from the corporate world to being a writer. What have been your key motivators? Wow, that makes me pause and think. Um, I think the biggest thing is to believe in, to just believe I could do it. I had a story to tell, and I think I'm not unique in that. I think each one of us has a story to tell. My time had come to speak up and to write my book. Um, and you take a punt. You take a punt on yourself, and I did. Wonderful. Monica, you spoke about um, you know, more women being there in, in finance. Um, do you think women, not only in finance, but in media as well, do they have more of a level playing field, you know, as far as, you know, going up the corporate ladder is concerned? So in media, um, so in finance, we've actually seen it work. But in media, yes, uh, women have a very good work environment. But 
I don't see all that many women editors. So when you talk about women becoming leaders, there are very senior journalists. But I think I was one of the very few uh, editors of a, a financial magazine. I was editing Outlook Money. So possibly those barriers are still there, which uh, either prevent us from aspiring, uh, taking that it's a belief thing that I can do it. And I must share with you that uh, when I was being offered uh, being editor of Outlook Money, the sort of internal battles I had with myself, I can't do it, I've never done it. I'm, I've been a stay-at-home mom for so long, you know, I've just begun to work, how will I ever do it? And it's the messaging at that time, if your spouse and your friend can sit you down and say, okay, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, just go for it. So, those, so people that you surround yourself with, that also makes so much difference. So the voice within, I think that sounded very familiar, you know, that voice before the big job. So uh, audience, please keep your questions ready and I'm going to come back to you after my last question for the panel. And I'd like all of you to answer this because you're, you know, you're such influential women and we have in the audience very young and inspiring women. What message would you like to give the young and future women leaders in the audience today? Okay. Uh, I think it's very important to be able to be a leader is to, um, to be able to that, get that lens of strength and warmth together. You know, to be able to manage being strong and having that warmth simultaneously. And I guess after you have that lens, then never retreat, I guess, and never apologize. Because, and just get the things done and let them howl for yourself. Wonderful. Next, Monica. Um, so, uh, messages for people out there is, it's actually the old grandmother advice, which is applicable to both the men and women. Good, sincere, hard work, and uh, just to keep doing what you really love to do. And that sort of message works for both men and women. It's just that the women sort of give up uh, halfway because they believe they can't. The, the messaging around them has been such that you can't. But actually, uh, women are better equipped simply because we, uh, we, we go on doing something sincerely till it sort of, uh, you know, we, we clear that hurdle. So just keep at it and keep the good qualities going because finally that's what succeeds. Thank you, Monica. Um, I pick up from both of, uh, of, of what um, they've just said. Um, basically, I think it's, in, uh, it's about believing in yourself, uh, daring to be, and um, expanding into whatever you want to do. So if you have a passion, go for it. Because sooner or later, that is what's going to make you different. It's going to make you, um, it's, make, going to make, it's going to bubble up and you're going to rise with it. Um, a lot of us make compromises and balance because earning versus passion. Somewhere it'll become, it'll uh, start to equalize and you'll be able to take that, uh, to grow your horizons. So do that. There's no glass ceiling unless you put it for yourself. There's only a blue sky. So go for it. Thank you. The message was basically three circles. The first circle was think of what do I really like to do? What do I really enjoy doing? Because you're going to be doing it for a large part of every day for many years to come. Then draw another circle which overlaps with this one where you define of the things that you like to do, what are you good at doing? You know, I, I love to play the piano, but I can only about manage, uh, you know, happy birthday well. So I'm never going to be a piano teacher. But so I have to think about also of the things I like, what do I do well? And because I'm a finance major, the, the third circle was very important. Of the things you like to do, that you do well, what can you get paid to do? And you find that little triangle in the middle that has the overlap of all of those three things. And hopefully, you know, once you find something you really like to do, Work doesn't feel like work anymore. I made the transition from banking to education. I never thought I'd do it. I've never been happier in my life. So find something you like to do and find someone who'll pay you to do it. Thank you for that wonderful message. Any questions? Yeah. Please. Hi, so my name is Samir. I work with Barclays. I have a Comment and I have a question, both directed at Pooja. So the uh, sure. comment is that 
The received wisdom is that men look very smart in armed forces uniforms. I have to say it's equally true for women, right? So, uh, and the uh, question I have is that, you know, I, I was actually quite pleasantly surprised this time that uh, at, the, at the independence, at the Republic Day Parade, right? There were so many contingents of women being led by women, et cetera, et cetera. Now you are, you know, in the armed forces. So do you feel that on the ground, do you, what do you feel being there? I mean, do you really feel that it's, you know, it's, it's embraced? Do you feel it's like resistantly embraced? Or what do you really feel being a woman in the armed forces? Firstly, thank you for the compliment. Um, um, you know, when you talk about seeing so many women walking out in the Rajpath, um, you know, and somebody just told me, you know, today itself, somebody was just telling me, you know, that, oh, so many women are coming in, you know, so it's like increasing. So I just told them that it's always so. It's just that it's become visible this time. It's just because this was done that people are seeing that there's so many lady officers in the armed forces, you know, so it's always been there. And if I'm not wrong, you're talking about how does it actually, is it equal? you know, and everything like that, it's totally equal. It's just the same. I'm lucky to be in such an organization which might be gender, you know, male majority, but there's no gender bias. So uh, we train together, we selected on the same criteria, exactly same criteria. You trained together, given the same training throughout with the same kind of levels which you have to, you know, you have to do and, you know, the same barcodes and everything apply. You become the same officer, you lead the same number of people, you have the same kind of appointments and things like that. Yes, again, when we come to the question that why are we not there on the top yet, but because I think the male officers started getting inducted in 32 and we started getting inducted in 92, so that's the gap which is slowly filling up. So otherwise, I'm, I'm lucky, I think I'm very lucky. That's, that's where the role of the organization comes. That's the role of the organization comes for women to be able to do well. I came back after my child, two months after that. You know, I was called specifically, you know, that you've got to join work. So that's something which I need to work on. But at the same time, when I need to go back home to look after my daughter in the middle of my work, nobody stops me. So that's, that's how the organization supports and that's how the organization can make women who are really ambitious to excel. Attitude. Good question. I will just kind of uh, grit my teeth and say, can we just keep gender out of this? And uh, it's extremely irritating to be sort of patronized and say, let the lady speak. You know, so I think if, if you're sitting somewhere, you're part of, and I actually sit in meetings where I'm the only woman because finance, a lot of it uh, is still largely male in uh, some of the boardrooms and all. Um, so no, so if, if you are uh, very solid with your content, with what you know, what you're authoritative about, then I suddenly feel the gender bias goes away. They're not looking at you as a woman at all. They're looking at you as a person who's come here with a certain skill and is going to contribute to the meeting. So I've, I mean, it's been a long time since somebody said, let the lady speak. Okay, because I think that, that question came from something I said, so let me just qualify that. Um, I think one thing I've learned uh, after so many years of working and often again, you know, being one of the uh, few women who've been uh, in these uh, meetings, I've learned to take myself a little less seriously. I don't get so excited or perturbed about things like this anymore. You know, the comment that was made about uh, poor Satya Nadella who made that unfortunate comment. Quite frankly, obviously he didn't mean the way it, it, the way it came around. I think sometimes you have to allow the other person to maybe be saying it and give them the benefit of the doubt. It isn't always badly intended. Um, of course, it can be slightly patronizing, so you find a way to make a positive out of a negative. And that's something that I find has helped me a lot. Ever since I sort of let that button go off in my head and say, I'm not going to get upset about something, and make the best out of that situation, my life's been much easier. So that's, that's the attitude I've learned to take. Yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, I've taken both, you know, I think when somebody tells you let the lady speak, I think we should take the opportunity. Because we'll be able to speak and next time when they tell you the lady speaks is not because of your gender, but because they are genuinely interested in what you've got to say. 